First chapter that we're going to talk about today is mergers and re-engineering, and, and that's why I asked you guys if you, you know, could relate or had any personal examples. Currently, what's starting to happen is that as times are changing within healthcare, there's some hospitals that just can't hang. They can't handle being on their own. So what you're starting to see is more hospitals and, and healthcare organizations do exactly what you guys are talking about, is join together and merge and form affiliations with other hospitals in the community. Um, now, it sounds like a good idea, you know, on, on the onset because no one gets fired or the, the hospital doesn't have to close, but there's a lot that goes into a merger. Um, and there's a lot of changes that go on. One process that happens is called re-engineering. Basically what re-engineering is, is to redesign or to change processes so that they run more smoothly. So if two companies are joining together, there may have to be some re-engineering going on to make sure that you don't have any overlap in certain um, areas or any overlap of job duties to make sure that everybody's fitting into their own place so that everybody can work together. So here's some of the goals of re-engineering. Obviously, when you re-engineer, you're supposed to become more productive. It sh the opposite should not happen. If you go through a re-engineering process, um, it shouldn't take longer to do things. It shouldn't be wasteful. So you should become more productive. You should also um, see a reduction in cost. You should be able to start saving money um, if it's done correctly, which also will um, move on to improve quality. You should start seeing better quality with your patient care or whatever it is, type of service that you provide, which will make you more competitive in the marketplace. If you're starting to see more um, improved quality and higher patient satisfaction, then you're going to be the company that everybody wants to come to. So that's gonna heighten up your uh, competitiveness. Obviously, you're gonna make more money. If you're saving costs and you're being more productive, you're gonna make more money. Um, we talked about patient satisfaction. Um, now, we just went over a lot of uh, advantages to be engineering, but sometimes the biggest goal or the ultimate goal is to just survive, keep your head above water. Um, in some cases, if you don't re-engineer, both companies will fail. Here are some things that re-engineering is not. Um, these are some of the things that your employees may think when they hear the word re-engineering. Um, it's not methods improvement. It's not downsizing. Some employees may say, oh, if we're re-engineering, that means people are going to get cut, people are going to get fired, hours are going to go down. Um, it's not right-sizing, restructuring, or reorganizing. So these are all the things that re-engineering is not, but these may be some of the things that you hear from your employees because this is how they perceive it to be. Now, how are you able to be successful with your re-engineering? Well, one of the most important things is you got to have the right type of leadership. So you have to have a leadership style that um, is participated. What that means is a leadership style that joins in with everybody else and is not just um, a leader who leads from behind here. A participative uh, management is a leader that's going to do this sit down with their employees and work together with them as if they're actually a, a member of the team. That's participative management. Um, it has to have a leadership style that features delegation. We talked about delegation a little bit last week and knowing what duties and tasks to assign to other people. You have to be able to empower your employees and make them feel like their contribution matters. Um, make them feel like they have an important part in the re-engineering process and self-directed teams. Does anybody know what self-directed teams are? Does the team take charge and they'll be responsible for getting the job done? Or as in a team, they delegate the people to exactly. their task. A self-directed team is basically a team that can handle their own. Mm -hmm. um, it's a team that can pretty much take their task from their manager and take it from there. Mm -hmm. um, and and self-directed teams, especially in a process like this, are very important because you want to make sure that um, you have responsible people on the team that can carry what they need to on their backs and not have to always run 
to the manager for everything. So self-directed team is very important. Um, one of the most important things that happens during re-engineering is that it can sometimes be difficult because your employees or your staff may get comfortable and they may get used to doing things the way that they've always been done. And with a lot of re-engineering that goes on, it often involves change. So one of the biggest challenges that you'll find is that your staff will not necessarily be excited about changing something that they've done forever or done for as long as they've been there. Um, so one way to kind of help with that is you'll find that some companies will bring in outside consultants to help with that aspect of employees not wanting to change. Um, consultants are expensive, so all companies cannot afford consultants, but the ones that can benefit because consultants kind of serve as a third party non-biased person. <coughs> they have no allegiance to anybody in the organization, they're not on anybody's side, they've been hired to come in and give an objective opinion and recommendations. So any information that they give is going to be unbiased, it's not going to favor anybody. Um, another advantage is that they come in knowing nothing about your organization or nothing about what has been going on. So um, they can't be influenced. If they come in not knowing anybody, not knowing what's going on, they can't be swayed one way or another. They're just going to give uh, a fair opinion of whatever it is. Um, and then they come in with expertise. Uh, typically, most consultants do this all the time. So they become experts at coming in and being able to help re-engineer processes. Um, there's been plenty of times where I, I got called into different hospitals to do different re-engineering processes, and it is helpful for them to have somebody come in from the outside. Like I said, um, all organizations can't afford to bring in consultants. Um, some organizations have created positions where they have their own consultants within their organization and that's all they do. So um, you'll find that different organizations will have different needs and different resources, but this is a common um, occurrence, is to bring in consultants from the outside to help with the re-engineering process. One thing that sometimes happens, even after the consultants leave and they provided their recommendations to the company, is that sometimes the re-engineering process or changes will only be applied to one department. And why might that not be a good idea? Let's say that um, we, um, we wanted to re-engineer our surgery process, and so the uh, re-engineering changes only went to the surgery department and stopped there. What might be wrong with that? There may be other departments that need re-engineering as much as the surgery department. Are you close? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> um, that it may affect, if we re-engineer the surgery department, but the other departments, like the human resource part at the front that we needed to re-engineer to, re to their needs? Maybe? You're close. You guys are hot or warm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, departments will have to adjust to the changes. Yes, exactly. Even if the re-engineering process is about surgery, there are other departments that depend on and work with the surgery department as well. So those changes in the surgery department may directly affect other departments. If we are changing, if, if we're having issues with our, our surgery times and our surgery times continue to be late and we're starting late and we figured out a way to fix that, but we haven't worked with our patient transport department, We've missed the critical um, element, right? Mm -hmm. Because if the uh, patient transport department are the people that wheel in the patients and they, they don't know that we've changed the times and pushed the times back to start at 6 a.m. instead of 7 a.m., we're going to have chaos, right? So it's very important that the re-engineering process involves all different departments and not just that one specific department because there may be other areas in the organization that are directly related to where that um, re-engineering process is going on. So it has to be more of an organizational change and not just the depart departmental change because at some point or another, it's gonna affect more people than just the people in the surgery department. Um, a lot of times um, when people hear re-engineering, as we said earlier, employees may think 
um, downsizing or layoffs. And this is probably one of the biggest things to overcome is because people already have that seed in their mind that once they hear about changes that it automatically means people are going to get fired. And what happens at that point? The morale goes down. Morale goes down. What else? People start looking for squirm and looking for new jobs. Mm -hmm. Start looking for new jobs. So some people might leave, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What else? Workflow may slack. Yes. Workflow may slack. If people are feeling like, oh, I'm going to get fired anyways, I could just take two hours mm -hmm. for lunch, or I can come in 30 minutes later, or I can only do half of the work that I'm supposed to do instead of all of it. So all of you guys are correct. These are all things that are connected to just having that perception in your mind that because we're having changes go on, this is what's going to happen. So as managers, you guys have to be aware of that's going on within your employees and try to some type of way, you know, get rid of those perceptions that they have. And, and some of it is about how you spend it when you um, initially come to your department or your employees and you tell them that re-engineering processes are going on, maybe one of the first things you say is, we are not letting anybody go, so that they can already kind of dismiss that um, from their minds, rather than just saying, okay, these are the changes we're gonna make and not reassuring anybody at all. Um, so how does it affect us as managers or supervisors? Well, it sometimes affects us also because sometimes when mergers happen, it may be for us a loss of position or a change of position. So we have to realize that as well. It may also mean that instead of me just managing these individuals, I now have to manage all of these individuals because we merged into one department. So it could mean more responsibilities for you or a larger span of control. Now, um, if we're not one of those supervisors that gets laid off, um, here are some of the things that a merger may mean for us. Again, like I just said, we may have to spend more time managing if we have more people to manage, which is going to mean what? We have less time to do our own work. We may have to do more planning and more organizing. Probably we'll have to do more delegation. Prioritizing is going to become more important. Again, because we have more duties, more tasks, more people to manage, our time management skills will become more important. We also have to make sure that we personally organize things so that we can continue to be good managers or more effective managers. And we also have to make sure that our people skills, because we are managing more people now, we have to make sure that our people skills are together and on task. Um, so that's chapter four. Let's go back to a little, for a little bit um, your examples of merging. Now based on the stuff that we've talked about so far in that chapter four talking about merging, were, was there anything that stood out to you or anything that in your situations that was not done? Yeah. All right, well in my situation now, um, first thing they said, we're keeping everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> As soon as they got in there, like two months later, they got this self established and got everything set up. Is that like 400 of us? So, what might have been the better way to approach that? What do you think? Uh, or anybody? I'm not just them. They, they could have told. Well, they, 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 could, they shouldn't have said, We're not letting anybody go. Okay. They should, if they knew they were letting somebody go, they should have said, Okay, we are going to be letting a few people go, but you'll be notified. Uh, or what type or what department, which department they're letting go, whatever. whatever. Instead of just saying we're gonna, we're not letting anybody go, and then afterwards right. they end up letting people go. Somebody else. That was they did it, and I, I kind of, they did it because it was false security, basically. But yeah, right. They did it into the sense of saying you know, we need, we need to make this merger, but after they really look at the bigger picture, which they should have done to get and look at the bigger picture of their finances, revenue and how many people they can hold and could not hold and let those people off and work with what they had with a team that they were really going to build with. Let's stop right there. Do you do you guys think that they really thought that they weren't going to let anybody go? They knew. Yeah. They, knew. they knew, right? They knew. Yeah. So a better response <coughs> might have been, we're about to have a merger, there's a possibility that some people may be, that way you're not telling people they're going to get fired because, you know, they're going to quit anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think a better way would have been, 
where, you know, mergers coming, there's a possibility some of you all may get laid off. I think that's fair, that people have an idea that there's a possibility, but at the same time, <coughs> they're not feeling like they just received their pink slip. Yeah. So, much. When they first brought in the other company from Denmark, mm -hmm. they switched over all of our equipment. When they were switching over the equipment, they had us, th they had the, the skeleton crew, and they would have us paint and do a bunch of unnecessary stuff that they claimed was just to better the company. And then when they got the equipment in and they started doing the production to work out all the kinks and stuff, well, once we got the machine running, they supposed to be better because it was all metal. So they said it was going to be better quality, better production, this, that, and third. And then we had to go in and replace a bunch of the different parts of the steel DVD cases because it was off stamped. The it was just a bunch of stuff that was wrong. So the it was the quality was worse and a lot of different problems with the product. So that was worse and then there was hardly anybody that worked there. So we were working like a whole bunch of overtime. And we were working seven days a week trying to put out the production that they wanted. So that was it was So you saw the increase Workload. Yes. Part. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, any other comments about mergers and reengineering? It's happening more and more uh, um, as healthcare organizations are losing money and having reimbursements cut. This reengineering stuff is happening more and more because hospitals and healthcare organizations are trying to figure out how they can stay above water, how they can continue to provide these services, but not at added cost. So this is something that most of you will probably see at some point in your career. Um, we're moving on to chapter five, talking about um, position description and performance standards. So this is a little bit related to hiring um, and, and how you write your job descriptions. So you guys know what a job description is, right? When you're looking for jobs, it's pretty much the thing that um, explains what the requirements are of the job, um, it's, this is the thing that gives you more information about what exactly you'll be doing if you are to be hired for this job, right? We also know that positions usually have two categories. They're either salaried or hourly. Salaried um, positions are exempt. Hourly are not exempt. Usually salary positions do not receive overtime. Um, hourly positions will get paid for overtime, usually time and a half. There's pros and cons to both positions. Um, for most manager positions, at some point you'll get to be salaried. You may say, wow, that's great. I'm going to make the same regardless. Uh, you're going to work a lot of overtime and not get paid for it. So um, there's pros and cons to both. Um, some uh, positions will have a summary statement, not all. A summary statement is basically kind of related to the job description. Um, it is a statement that basically tells you what the purpose of the position is or the goals of the position. You'll also see listed required competencies. These uh, talk about the skills or qualifications that uh, the person may need to do the job. Good descriptions will also include the reporting relationship, meaning if you get this job, who do you report to? Now, all job descriptions don't have this, but I think it's an added plus when they do, so that you already know who you report to. A good job description will also show these things. The authority of your position, uh, how much independence you'll have, well, obviously what your responsibilities and duties are, anything above and beyond, special demands, and what type of working conditions. Usually it'll say something like, um, must be able to lift, you know, 50 pounds, or, you know, you're on your feet a lot for this job. So working conditions are important. Why do we use job descriptions? Obviously we use them for interviewing. Um, that's one of the most common uses. We also use it for training. I think it's very smart to, as you're training and going through orientation with new employees, to have that job description right there in front of them so that as they're being trained, they can refer to it and see how it matches what's in the job description. Um, and evaluations. 
it, when you get to that point where you're having your annual evaluation with the employee, it's also great to have the job description right there. In the event that they have not been doing their job and you give them a poor evaluation, you have proof right there with the job description that you can say, you know, according to the job description, you are supposed to do this every day. You have not been doing it, and that's why you receive X, Y, Z on your evaluation. Um, here are some other uses that you can use the job description for. Um, advertising, uh, looking at jobs for raises or promotions, if you have to counsel an employee, um, evaluating compliance, if you're trying to document if someone's doing their job, and for legal purposes, if there's any type of you know, lawsuit or anything going on, you may need to provide the job description. So performance standards. Anybody know what performance standards are? Have you ever heard of them? It basically tells your staff or your employees how well they need to do their job. And not just how well, how much, or how often as well. Um, some positions may be on a bonus metric, uh, maybe like a base pay plus bonus. Uh, especially in cases like that, the performance standards are very important because they help to justify if the bonus is necessary or not. That's like a production. Like if you're working on a production line, mm -hmm. maybe you have to put out a certain amount. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, um, pay for performance is something that is starting to become more relevant um, and more active in healthcare also. Um, they're starting to try to relate it to quality. So in some organizations, the higher quality you provide, the more of a bonus or whatever you may receive. Um, for now, it's mostly been um, involved with physicians and healthcare providers, mm -hmm. but at some point it could continue to trickle down to other types of employees as well. I know um, I've worked in places um, where I was in the management position, and the managers would sometimes give bonuses if the organization as a whole did well. So is it's something, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Is that kind of like the customer service type thing? Like the more? There's some organizations the that will pay um, if their um, patient satisfaction scores are high. Is yeah, kind of like that? Yeah. Oh. Um, if you don't have performance standards, Sometimes when you go to evaluate employees, it can sometimes be ambiguous or um, very subjective, and it may look like what you evaluated them on is basically just your opinion and not anything factual. So the performance standards can be very helpful when it comes time for evaluations. So these are both levels that I'm sure you've seen before. Some organizations only use two levels of performance standards, which is meets the standards or fails to meet the standards. Other organizations will have three levels where, where you do not meet expectations, you meet expectations, and you exceed expectations. So these are all levels of performance standards. Um, an appropriate standard, how do we choose our performance standards? We should go by these things. Um, we, we need to describe a level that is below performance um, so that they understand what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for you to um, only uh, have two patients a day. You need to oversee five patients a day. You know, that's our standard. That's what's acceptable. The standard needs to be a little bit challenging, not too challenging, but it needs to be a little challenging, but something that people can achieve. So we don't want to set it too high. It needs to be something that can be results-based. So I can't just say, you know, Crystal, I want you to smile at five patients a day. That's not really results-based. The only way I would find that out is if I go ask the patients, and then I have to find out which patients you said you smiled at. You know, as opposed to, I need you to, um, go into the patient's rooms every two hours. That's something that can be results based because I can put a sign in sheet in that room with a time so that you can sign your name and the time you were there. That's something that's results based that I can check as opposed to something that's subjective. Okay. Um, to keep going, it deals with performance that employees can control. Again, 
Sure, we can somewhat control you smiling at patients, but to a certain extent, that's not really something we can control. Should be, though. I mean, you wouldn't want to go into somebody's room with, that's not a word I should use. You, um, say, you say you can control it. However, but listen, why would listen. you take your bad mood out on somebody else if you were? It happens, had? though. What if you come in one morning, you had a bad morning at home? It's not their fault. It's not their fault, but it happens. So it's something you should have control, but at the same time, it may not be something you can control every day. There may be something bigger that's controlling you outside of that, right? Yes, I so we want to make sure that it's something that an employee can control. Um, we want to make sure that it's something that they can understand, right? We want to make sure that it's something that is not always or never. Try to always leave these words out at any time when you're managing. Because it's very hard to go back on if you say, I'm always gonna do this, or I'm never gonna do this. And then the one time you do it, your credibility goes down. So try to avoid using those words. Um, and it needs to be something that's understood by everybody. So the standards you create need to be clear cut, something that I can understand, something that you can understand, something that everybody can understand. Obviously, we need to create standards that do not discriminate. If we keep on the same example, somebody might say, well, you only smiled at the women patients. You didn't smile at the men patients, right? <laughs> so we want to make sure that we set the standards. <laughs> we set standards that can, in any way cannot be discriminatory towards anybody, right? Um, and we want to make sure that it's something that obviously benefits our patients. If we, if I set a standard um, of, I don't know, you got to bring us in donuts every Friday. That in no donuts way. Donuts in the car drivers. It may not, it's like not really, you know, affecting our patients, right? True. I mean, it may be because maybe we're happy after getting the donut, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, so, so that's performance standards. Anybody have any questions on that? Um, this is the last chapter that we're going to try to cover, and this is staff development. Staff development. Um, career development. Has anybody experienced going through a career development program at any kind of job? You? I did at school. You did at school. What did it entail? Um, <clears throat> um, as far as um, how to carry yourself in a, um, in a work environment, okay. um, your work ethics, your um, customer service, and if you're in management, um, how to handle different situations and everything. Okay. How to build yourself up. All right, so it sounds like it was mostly talking about the self-esteem portion of it. That and um, uh, making yourself eligible for promotion. Okay. So there's all different types of career development programs. Every organization is going to structure theirs differently. It really just depends on that organization and, and what they deem is most important in, in developing their people. Um, educational planning is um, something where you, know, you may have a um, entry level person, entry level mm -hmm. position person, and as a manager you may want to sit down with them and create an educational plan. Basically what that is is it's a plan that um, explains to them what they may need to do in order to move up. So if we're working with an entry level person and you know, um, we may say, well, your educational plan may include going back to school to get further education. It could be receiving more training, going to more conferences, whatever it may take for them to get more education so that it'll allow them to move up. That's basically an educational plan. Self-development. Um, as a manager, it's going to be your job to work with people, to help develop them. But to a certain degree, it's also about them developing themselves, right? There's only so much we can do as managers, right? Mm -hmm. So what that means is the individual has to have a certain level of internal motivation within themselves to want to develop, right? So as a manager, it may be important for you to seek that skill in certain people. What I mean by that is, and I'm, it's time for me to pick on you, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mr. Houston could be an exceptional worker, 
He comes to work every day on time. He can complete all his tasks. He can do all his work. He can go above and beyond. But let's say he's very shy and <laughs> does not believe in himself. He might not be a good candidate, right? Because if I provide him with all these resources, I pay for him to go to training, I've used company resources for him to, you know, go to this conference, but he's very shy and does not believe in himself and doesn't have that motivation, right? He might not be a good candidate for me to try to develop, right? Because now I've put not just my time and effort, I've put money mm -hmm. into someone who's not motivated. So it's important that when you're seeking out people to develop, you got to make sure they have that internal will. And for, you can't always see it, but most of the time you can kind of tell if a person has that within them or not. Um, because what you don't want to do is spend a lot of time and resources and money on an individual that doesn't have this, because then you they're wasteful. So self-development is key. Um, educational needs assessment. Basically, this is an assessment that is done, it can be done at a department level, it can be done at an individual level, but basically it tells us what's needed. So what do my employees need to be better? What do my employees need to develop? What does my department need to develop? Do we need to have, you know, maybe our books are outdated. Maybe we have the CPT books from 2006 and we need a 2013 edition. So maybe we need resources to buy new books. Um, so it could be anything, but it's basically an assessment that details what's needed for us to develop as a department, as an individual. Um, maybe we have some employees that are not tech savvy. Maybe they need some extra training on using a computer, using a new system so they can be brought up to speed. So it may not just be um, necessarily on an educational basis. Maybe it's what do we need to recharge our employees? What do we need to get them motivated again? What do we need to get them excited to come to work? Um, we also want to compare our employees to the overall healthcare field. Are there any skills that they're lacking? What types of skills might they need? Maybe the hospital um, down the road has their nurses doing X, Y, Z, but our nurses are only doing X. So we also want to evaluate that as well. So not just um, education, but also skills also fall under the needs assessment. Um, so how do we determine our training needs? Well, first, we want to look at our mission statement. We want to see what the purpose of our organization is. So if, the, if our mission statement includes providing high-tech service, we got to make sure our staff is able to provide high-tech service, right? Mm -hmm. um, we want to talk to the human resources department about things that they may know with regards to hiring those types of people that have those skills to come into our organization. We may want to review um, past evaluations to see if it's been a pattern of certain people not having these skills. Um, may want to look at our patient satisfaction surveys. Uh, is there any pattern with patients saying they wish their provider did this? Maybe our bedside manner needs work. And we obviously want to make sure that we're kept current on any legal changes that our staff may need to know about as well. How do we develop them? Once we figure out what we need, then we have to figure out how to develop them. So we can do on-the-job training. We can do cross-training. Cross-training is, you know, maybe I want uh, Carmen to shadow Shan one day mm -hmm. to see what she does or vice versa. That would be cross training. We may want to do in service education, may want to bring someone in to be a speaker to talk to us about changes in the Affordable Care Act, um, workshops and seminars, um, or programs at schools, colleges. These are all ways we can develop our employees. Um, here are some basic career building tips. How can we get early success? You ever heard anybody say, you know, get the low hanging fruit? Kind of the same thing. Try to work on the easier skills um, to help you 
get early success. For example, you know, when people are first coming into the school, we try to recommend that they have a fairly light schedule so that they can start off with a high GPA. It's kind of the same concept. So you want to work on easier skills to make sure you have early success. You obviously want to ask others to help. Never be afraid to ask for help. Um, you want to maintain a high ratio of praise to criticism. Everybody will need criticism at some point. But I think it's good to always try to also have some praise to balance the criticism. Um, you know, if you have someone coming in late, you may want to start off by saying, you know, you're a great employee, you're an asset to our organization. However, you have to stop coming in late. So you want to try to balance your criticism with praise. And um, you want to correct errors before they become habits. This is very important when you're just hiring people in and you're just starting. If you see something that they're doing wrong, catch it then before it becomes too much of a habit. It's going to be harder to break then. Patience. You have to be patient. As managers, we may want to see them just excel very quickly. We have to remember that there may be some plateaus in the process. So they may excel a little bit, and then they may hit a little plateau where they're kind of just going along with the same speed, and then they may excel again. We have to expect that. Everybody's not just going to continue to excel um, at the same pace. Um, you want to make sure that you're being seen as a coach or a cheerleader and not just as someone that's, you know, giving out tasks. Um, and you obviously want to use adult training methods. We'll be working with adults, so we don't want to treat them like children, even if they act like children. <laughs> and encourage mentorship. So even if I'm working with <clears throat> Mr. Bradley, I may say, you know, Candace here would be a great person for you to maybe go to lunch with one day. I think she may be able to be a great mentor for you. So you want to always continue to encourage mentorship. And does everybody know what mentorship is? Mentoring is basically when you have someone that's been where you want to go. So someone who may be experienced or influential or both that can give you guidance, advice, um, tell you what you need to do to be more successful. And I think regardless of how much you excel or regardless of what level you get to, you should always have mentors. I have mentors right now that I, you know, pick up the phone and call sometimes. I'm going through this, can you give me some advice? So you never stop having mentors. Or you should never stop having mentors, regardless of where you are. Um, but they're very important because you always want to have somebody in your corner, somebody that's going to be your advocate, somebody that's going to fight for you or support you through whatever it is you're going through. Um, so a counselor mentor is a certain type of mentor. Um, it's somebody that may, you know, like I just said, you can pick up the phone, call, what should I do? I have two job offers. Can you help me try to decide which one to take? These are the types of conversations you might have with your counselor mentor. Um, they're going to be the ones that, um, if they're in the organization with you, may say, watch out for this person, or this is the person you want to meet and talk to and get in good with. So they'll give you tips about the organization. Um, and these are people that are going to help you expand your network. So these are going to be people that say, you know, there's a meeting tomorrow. You should come with me so you can meet these people. So they are people that try to help you um, expand your network. Uh, creativity. A couple more minutes. Um, <clears throat> Creativity deals with obviously being able to come up with new ideas, um, new ways to do things. Creativity is very important, not just for the manager, but also for your employees to be creative. Here are some of the characteristics of creative people. They possess innumerable bits of information that relates to the focal point of their interests, right? They blot out to them what seems irrelevant or unimportant, so they're going to remove those things always curious, always asking questions, always wanting to know why this does this. They're usually optimistic, like to take risks, right? Um, they value independence and autonomy. So they don't mind you know, being autonomous or taking that independence. They actually enjoy the innovative process. They enjoy being creative. They enjoy being able to have the independence to be creative. They can sense when things are right or wrong. So here are examples of innovative managers or supervisors. 
We're always gonna believe there's a better way to do something. Sure, we're meeting our targets every month, but there's gotta be a better way to do this. Those are the people who are always continuing to learn. Those are our innovative supervisors. They view problems and challenges as challenges rather than something that's annoying. So just because you know, we have an issue, you know, we shouldn't get down on ourselves and think that it's something that is annoying or something that we can't solve. We look at it as a challenge. We look at it as something that we're going to do that better next month. So we look at it as um, an opportunity to be innovative or to be creative. We don't get down on ourselves when something doesn't happen. We look at our failures as learning experiences, right? We try to encourage our employees to brainstorm and to be creative themselves. And we're tolerant of ambiguity, right? Red tape. Creative supervisors cut red tape. What red tape? They don't see red tape. Um, they set aside some time each day for reflective thinking. Very important. For me, it's usually at the beginning of my day. But I try to always set aside some time for reflective thinking. This is when you get those ideas, is when you set aside that time for reflective thinking. Um, they inject humor into situations, and they're willing to stick their necks out to support their ideas. So somebody that's truly innovative, they won't just have a great idea. They're going to take that risk and step out there to actually go forth with doing it. Here are some barriers to creativity. Some people may think you're crazy or think your ideas are crazy, right? There may be the fear of failure. Or there could be just rules or policies that prohibit this type of creative thinking. Maybe they may say, we don't have the funds to do that, we don't have the money, we can't afford to do that. That's crazy, you know? There may be all, um, more barriers than the ones that are listed here to, to your creativity. Um, understaffing, maybe we don't have enough staff to do that. You know, sounds like a great idea, but we don't have the resources. Maybe there's a lengthy chain of command. Maybe you gotta get it approved by this person, this person, this person, this person, and before it's a go. Um, or maybe somebody just said your idea was dumb. Maybe you had discouraging remarks. All barriers to creativity. How do we stimulate creativity within our staff? First thing you wanna do is identify, know who they are. Know who your innovative people are. Then you wanna emphasize creativity, obviously during orientation and training, but even after that, you still wanna to continue to emphasize creativity. And you want to make sure people have enough independence to be creative. Sometimes when I give you guys assignments, I only give you a little bit of instructions. That's on purpose. I'm trying to get you guys, I'm trying to stimulate creativity. Um, if I give you too much and not, a, you know, if I don't give you that loose rein, you can't be creative. So for some assignments, I may give you more direction than others. That's on purpose because I'm trying to get you guys to be creative. You can't nitpick or demand perfection when you're trying something new or encouraging people to be creative. You have to let them be able to take some risks and make some mistakes without being fearful for losing their jobs. And you obviously need to provide the right resources. You can't tell someone to go off and be creative and then they don't have the resources to do it. Exposure is gonna be important. You wanna make sure you expose those employees that you're encouraging to be creative to different meetings and seminars, guest speakers. Maybe you, um, for lunch one day, you want them to watch this lecture about X, Y, Z because you think it may help them to, to be creative. Customer input. Sometimes when employees can hear the patient satisfaction, whether they're good or bad, maybe that'll stimulate some ideas out as to how they can do things differently. And uh, vendors and sales reps. Uh, especially if you're working in a hospital, there's a lot of traffic of uh, vendors and sales reps, and they often come with new information, things that haven't really been released yet. So it's a great way to kind of stay up on what's going on and can also help your employees to become more creative and innovative about things that they can change. This is how you should respond to any idea. And they call it PIC. So P is positive. So if someone gives you an idea, positive will be, I think that's a good idea, let's try that. Um, if you're not all the way on board, you can say, that sounds pretty interesting, let me look into it some more, or let's look into it some more. Or if it's a terrible idea, you don't wanna say, that's a terrible idea. You might wanna say, 
Um, uh, you know, I have some reservations about that because X, Y, Z. But you don't want to just say, you know, it's a crappy idea or, you know, that's dumb or whatever. So you should always use one of these as a response to any type of ideas that may be presented to you. Because you don't want to discourage them from never coming back again with more ideas. So you want to be careful in your response. Here's some killer phrases that you don't want to say. <laughs> okay. Got to be kidding. That would never work here. The trouble with that idea is, or I'm paid to do the thinking. Wow. Don't say any of these, <laughs> please. <laughs> don't say any of these. Here are some positive reactions. Maybe on to something. Tell me more. How might I be able to help you? Let's try it out. Or can you basically can you give me more information on it? Um, we're gonna stop there because we're out of time. Any questions or comments about today?